why would Joseph be afraid? I could see why he'd be upset, why he'd be frustrated. I could see all kinds of things, but fear. So in order to understand this, we have to go back into that <coughs> prophecy of Isaiah that you heard this morning with the king, King Ahaz. The king is also a son of David, and you notice Joseph is addressed as son of David also. It means they're descendants of the royal family. So the king, the son of first son of David here, the king has decided to do a political move that isn't too smart. And so what happens in that case is the king is supposed to talk to the court uh, religious official, in this case the prophet Isaiah, what's God's will given this situation? And what the king wants is that the prophet will say, well, God wants you to do what you decided because you're the king. But the prophet doesn't do that. Now, what's the setting? The northern kingdom of Israel, this is the king of Judah we're talking about, the northern kingdom of Israel has decided to get into an alliance with Syria. And they want to force the southern kingdom into that alliance. The king doesn't want to do that. So what the king does instead, which is really <coughs> not too smart, is he appeals to Assyria. Don't get that mixed up with Syria. Assyria is over in the region that's now Iraq. And the Assyrian Empire is big and mighty. And people back in Jerusalem are telling the king, you know, this isn't the smartest thing in the world to do. What makes you think Assyria is going to be nice once they come over through Syria and Israel? And say, oh, I'm not coming into your kingdom because we're nice. <laughs> not smart. So the prophet tells him, don't do this. And the king says, but I want to. And the prophet says, God will give you a sign. The king doesn't want a sign. <laughs> he wants only tell me I'm doing the right thing, and he's not hearing it. He doesn't want the sign. And this is why Isaiah says, is it not enough for you to weary God and people? Stop it. But the, God will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and bear a son. Now, a lot of modern translations of the Bible turn that into the young maiden or something like that. But I think it would be smart if we go back into the culture and how they translated it themselves. If you go back several hundred years before Jesus was born in the city of Alexandria, northern Egypt, big colony of Greek-speaking Jews there, and so scholars of the law translate the Old Testament's materials they're using then into Greek because a lot of these Jews around the empire speak Greek not Hebrew, not Aramaic, but Greek. Those scholars, hundreds of years before Jesus, knew what the prophet meant. The Hebrew word is ambiguous, but the Greek word they chose is very specific, virgin. It's not young lady or maiden or something like that. It's virgin. Well, that translation of the Bible is called the Septuagint, and that translation became wildly popular all over the Jewish world, even in Palestine, where Jesus will be born a couple hundred years later. That's the version they usually used. It got translated back into Hebrew and Aramaic. It was so good. Hebrew and Aramaic to Greek, from Greek back to Hebrew and Aramaic. You see what happened. About 300 times out of the 350, when the New Testament quotes the Old like it did today, it's the Septuagint translation. This is an example. Now, why is all that important? Because the sign is important. The sign, if it had been a young lady getting pregnant, well, gosh, you think that's the first time in history that ever happened? <laughs> what kind of sign would that be? It wasn't much of a sign. But the virgin conceiving... Wow, that's a sign. And so Joseph knows this scripture. And this is why it makes sense to him when the angel speaks. And his fear as a son of David shrinks away and he knows what to do. Unlike the king, the son of David who stays fearful and does the wrong thing, Joseph does the right thing. He knows what to do because... God inspires him through the angel in this dream. That's what the gospel just told us.
So I hope you realize that in your own life, we have these fear times. I'm thinking of so many people when they have their first baby. I've heard this so many times. Oh my God, what do I do? The baby cried. You know? <laughs> By the time the third baby comes along, oh, mommy, you want to play in the freeway? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, obviously it's an exaggeration, but you don't fret so much after a couple of children. You're not as afraid, right? So you begin to relax into it, and it becomes more normal. You don't walk in fear. You have to walk in courage, and this is exactly what Joseph does. He walks in faith. Courage, the thing the king didn't have, the carpenter has. Who acts more like the king, the son of David? It's Joseph, not the king that we heard about. It's the carpenter from Nazareth. What a change. How about yourself? Can you apply that to your own life? What are the things that get you afraid and really start to dominate and hem in your life? And which are the things that open you up and give you courage? And having courage doesn't mean bad things don't happen. It means you deal with them in a different way. I can remember well when I was a hospital chaplain working with a man who was dying of cancer. He was really scared, good reason. But the point came when he had a spiritual experience. He was no longer afraid. And what a difference that made as he walked toward death. He said goodbye to fear on the way. Hmm. You see, these things have very practical applications. I hope today you can realize that yourself in your own life, whatever your situations might be, that we can walk together in faith into the future as Joseph did. That's a mission for us, and that's a mission from the gospel. 